to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hello, I'm Congressman Bill Pascrell, and I would like to welcome you to this latest edition of To the Point. There is a renewed global threat of terrorism in the wake of San Bernardino and the attacks in Paris. The world powers are engaged in military missions in Syria, a nation engulfed in civil war for almost five years. The geopolitical ramifications of the Syrian conflict are significant, significant. At the same time, militant extremists are targeting freedom-loving nations. This confluence of events has all our full and undivided attention in this country. President Obama has asked Congress to authorize the use of military force against ISIS or ISIL or Daesh. We'll get into that in a few moments, what we call them. You can call it whatever you prefer. New developments require us to reevaluate our policy decisions every day. So with me today is a gentleman extremely capable of wading into the particulars of these topics. Representative California's 28th Congressional District Congressman Adam Schiff. Adam, thank you for being here. He's with us today. He's a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. He is the ranking member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and a member of the Benghazi Select Committee. Congressman Schiff has been a leader on national security and foreign policy with an emphasis on diplomacy, intelligence reform, and efforts to stabilize countries that are at risk in becoming the future failed states and havens for terrorists. So, Adam, welcome aboard. Thank you. Great uh, to be with you. And let me, let me say some things here in the beginning. Let me blow smoke. You know I'm, I can be critical and many, many times. <laughs> but you are a voice of reason through the discussions and debates that we've had on national security and what in God's name is going on in the Middle East and how it affects us. And I thank you for your service to your country. Uh, you're not only important on CNN on Sundays and Saturdays, but you're important all the time. And I, I think you're doing a hell of a job. I trust your judgment. I don't agree with you all the time, which is unimportant. But I do agree that there's no one in the Congress that's more apt of talking about what we're talking about today. Can you give us a summary from the Intel point of view as to where we are today, realizing that this show is going to be on for the next few weeks. But where are we today uh, in the second week of December of, of uh, 2015 as we look both at what happened in California, the disaster, what happened in Paris? Give us an Intel quick brief across the, across the lines as to what's the, you know, what's the truth and what's the the fiction here. Well, Bill, thank you for inviting me to be on your show and uh, my greetings to your constituents in New Jersey as well as uh, mine out in California. Great. Uh, you do a fabulous job in the Congress. You're a, a great representative, well respected on both sides of the aisle. So it's a particular pleasure to join you today. Uh, I'd be happy to do my best to give a nutshell I'm sure you on <laughs> uh, the situation in Iraq and Syria as well as the threat to our homeland. Uh, but it, it's very difficult because obviously so many international players uh, and the fight in Iraq and Syria uh, is predominantly about ISIS or Daesh, uh, but it's a, also a proxy fight of many of the major powers. Uh, and this is uh, what makes it so difficult ultimately to resolve. By the way, these murderers don't like to be, call, uh, be called Daesh. They don't, they don't like that reference. That, that means the uh, this person who plays on Discord. That's an insult to them. That's why I use the term Daesh. Well, it's why I don't, I don't like to, to refer to them as the uh, Islamic State. That gives them more credibility than deserve. Am I, uh, I think barking up the wrong trail? No, I think you're exactly right. And <laughs> Go ahead. I, 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 I prefer you. the term Daesh as well. I, I often use ISIS because not as many people are familiar with Daesh, but I like the fact that it's derogatory. It should yeah. be. It's a right. brutal, medievally evil organization, uh, and so no epithet is too, uh, too critical from my point of view. Uh, but in terms of what's going on there, um, we have a similar challenge uh, politically uh, on both sides of the Syria-Iraq border, and that is there's a large Sunni population in both countries 
that feels it has nowhere to go. Uh, in Iraq, the Sunni population uh, feels like it has been disenfranchised by the ruling Shia government in Baghdad. They think it's basically being run out of Tehran. Uh, well, that was primarily Mr. Maliki, right? Uh, yes. He Ma caused the discord, which caused the vacuum, which allowed these characters to take advantage of that vacuum. So, I mean, I want to go back and point fingers about uh, Iraq, but we're talking about what's happening right now and what the result of a vacuum, what, it, what happens? Well, Bill, I think you're exactly right. I mean, our troops went in there. Uh, they helped uh, establish uh, a government and security there. Um, Nouri al-Maliki, who was then the Iraqi prime minister, though, uh, decided to take that opportunity to consolidate his own power, to marginalize and exclude the Sunnis, uh, to weed out the, the Sunni officer class. And what uh, resulted from that was a hollowed out Iraqi military in which the Sunnis really had no meaningful role uh, and a Sunni population that felt disenfranchised. Uh, and that paved the way for a return of what had been al-Qaeda in Iraq, which we now know as ISIS. Right. Uh, and until that political problem is fixed in Iraq, there's going to be space for ISIS uh, right. in Iraq. Similarly, on the Syrian side of the border, you have a uh, Shia, an Alawite government led by Bashar al-Assad uh, with a majority Sunni population that is being barrel bombed by Assad. Right. Uh, so that Sunni population has a choice between uh, the Shia regime of Assad that's barrel bombing them or ISIS uh, or uh, any number now of other uh, Islamist groups, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the Al-Qaeda franchise, uh, Ahra al-Sham, which is a very militant Islamic group, and then about 500 other uh, rebel organizations. And these militant groups are trying to outdo one another, it should seem to me, reading about them. Uh, the, really, the founder of, da of Daesh uh, was a Jordanian, who's now dead, <laughs> uh, Zakawi. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was too radical for Al-Qaeda. <laughs> He was too radical for Ben Laden. So this is what we're facing now, isn't it? Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, um, Zarqawi used all these brutal attacks, uh, killing mostly Muslims, killing a lot of Shia right. Muslims. Uh, yeah, you know, that's an important point. Uh, I can't stress that enough when I talk about the Middle East and I talk about these very violent radical groups, that mostly Muslims get, are being killed by Muslims. Yeah, you that, know, we're, look, we're looked at as exactly the infidels. Right. But the fact of the matter is Muslims are killing Muslims, aren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and not only is uh, ISIS or Daesh killing Shia, they're also killing Sunni Muslims. That's correct. Uh, you know, if you don't uh, adopt uh, the caliphate, if you don't swear allegiance to Baghdadi, you're an infidel even if you're a Sunni. Uh, yeah. So uh, they have about as uh, uh, limited a tolerance for any diversity uh, of viewpoint even within their own faith. Uh, as you can imagine. Now, uh, if we go back to this map, if you look to your right, uh, up here in the top, top part of Syria, Raqqa, Daesh has used this as their headquarters. Well, that's exactly right. And we just cut off, you know, some paths of communication there uh, with Raqqa and other towns up there in Mosul. But what do we do? How do we get and defeat Daesh in their own capital? That would be a big victory to me. Oh, it, it would be. Uh, and, you know, running ISIS out of uh, the uh, caliphate business would be huge in, in several ways. Uh, it would be huge in that the fact that they hold land, that they call themselves a state or a caliphate, um, gives them the uh, propaganda right. advantage right. of recruiting thousands and thousands of foreign fighters who are really attracted by this idea of a caliphate. You obliterate the caliphate, you obliterate a lot of the magnet for recruitment. Right. Um, it also, though, holding that territory uh, between Syria and Iraq and, right. and cumulatively, uh, it's about a third of each, so that it's a huge uh, land holding. Uh, that allows them the time and the space and the resources they derive from oil, from taxation, uh, to plot uh, att uh, attacks against us here in the homeland. We're a harder target to reach than Europe. Right. Uh, so we're not in as immediate risk of a peristyle attack. But if they're given the time and luxury to hold that territory, they aspire to attack us sure. with a multiple style attack like we saw in Paris 
uh, and they'll have the capacity to do it. So uh, the clock is ticking. It, I think, heightens the importance of us really taking the fight to them. Um, and uh, and a as we saw so uh, painfully um, in California, just about an hour away from my district in San Bernardino, um, they also are, are very potent in terms of their ability to use social media to radicalize people at a distance. We're, we're going to talk about that and, then, and your perspective in terms of uh, intel. When I look back at when I look back at this situation, and I, and you know, eight, eight million Syrians are dislocated, four over four and a half million left the country, moving to Jordan. Uh, Lebanon and now into Europe, many countries. Uh, that country's devastated. A civil war created another vacuum for these murderers, for these people who so hate as well. And we're not going to beat that hate by more hate. We're not going to beat that hate by hating God's children. And all of a sudden, they're no longer God's children, I guess. Or one religion is better than another religion. We're not going to solve anything that way, are we? No, we're certainly not. And and, um, and I think we're doing a couple of things that are very counterproductive. Uh, certainly the, the horrendous comments by Donald Trump that we ought to bar all Muslims from coming in the country, even our own citizens, even Muslim members of our military that are deployed overseas, he would deprive from the ability to come back home. Uh, that just feeds into ISIS propaganda, and it's obviously antithetical to who we are as a people. Right. Um, but beyond that, you know, we, we've had this rush to pass legislation to bar refugees from coming into the country. I voted no. Well, <laughs> you and me both. Uh, and as you know, Bill, it's a long vetting process for a wow. refugee. It takes about a year and a half to two years to I, get through I, that. I've shown this before. You, you'll have to put up for two seconds. This is the vetting process. This is the, the uh, bureaucracy, uh, and, and it should be, that a... Uh, a refugee who wants to come into this country has to deal with 13, 14 steps. We've added another, uh, you know, step uh, for th those folks. And they're mostly young people. They're mostly children and mostly women who, who've come here with their children. They've got nothing but the clothing on their back. And uh, uh, this is the result uh, of what this group, this, this group Dash, has done. Well, and this is an important point, Bill, uh, because this is a really, a really a body blow to uh, Daesh's propaganda. You have millions of people, millions of Muslims, fleeing the caliphate. That's correct. If life is so great under the caliphate, how come They're millions leaving. of Muslims are voting with their feet? Uh, and there'd be millions more who want to get out. And but, that's what gives but me hope. ISIS <laughs> threatens them with death. I mean, right. look at Ramadi, this town in Iraq, which uh, Iraqi forces are encircling held by ISIS. ISIS is telling the civilians, we will kill you if you try to flee. Wow. And why? Because they want to use them as human shields. Yeah, that can't last too long. I, I think that from within, Daesh will destroy itself, whether there or here or any place. Am I being too optimistic? Well, I, I think they contain the seeds of their own destruction. Uh, but it, if left to their own devices and with the repressive kind of uh, really police state, they run, um, it will take too long for it to disintegrate on its own. So I think we're going to have to up the effort to defeat them uh, militarily, but also solve that political problem we talked about at the outset. We've talked about the physical things that we see and what's going on there. Forces, whether we should attempt, and the president wants an authorization for him to use military force. I want to talk to you about the philosophical and psychological uh, aspects of this, which Intel deals with. I taught a, a class in, on philosophy and psychology. Uh, in high school, this was, and I, I taught philosophy in college as well. But And uh, they had to read for me Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer. And uh, he was a longshoreman that had a very interesting perspective about radical, radical folks who, who try to use violence to uh, pursue their, their goals. He wrote this about radicalism and fanaticism. For men to plunge headlong into an undertaking of vast change, they must be intensely disconnected, yet not destitute. 
and they must have the feeling that by the possession of some potent doctrine, infallible leader, or some new technique, they have access to a source of irresistible power. They must also have an extravagant conception of the prospects and potentialities of the future. Finally, they must be wholly ignorant of the difficulties involved in their vast undertaking. Experience is a handicap. So the big thing that changed in these past 60 years uh, is that you don't actually have to join a mass movement anymore. You can follow it online and participate that way. Now, I, I took this from an article by David Brooks, a conservative writer for The Times, who I really like. I think he, he's, he's also a voice of reason like yourself, and how radicals are made. Now, you look at what happened in San Bernardino, and you say to yourself, what the heck could possess people? This couple had a baby, for crying out loud. I mean, what the hell were they thinking? Or was that immaterial? Were they that detached? Were they that disconnected? And they went out and killed all these innocent people who were there trying to have a nice time for that day. What do you think about what Eric Hoffer writes? And what do you think about the concept? And how do we really fight this? Do you fight this with bullets and guns? Is that the only way you fight this? Well, that's a very interesting quote. And obviously, a lot of elements you could apply to the radicalization yes. that's going on uh, today. Um, I don't know how to explain uh, how human beings are capable of what this couple did in San Bernardino. As you say, how do you drop off your baby with a family member and go out on a, a suicidal mission to kill, uh, in this case, one of the shooter's co-workers? Right. Co-workers who had a baby shower for them not long before the killing. That's right. How is that even possible? Uh, you have to be detached. You yes. have to be detached from, from humanity to do right. that. Uh, you also have to be under the spell of some powerful doctrine that you think justifies these kind of horrific crimes. Um, you know, how do we fight this? Uh, well, uh, in part, uh, you fight it militarily by depriving the, the, basically, the control center of this uh, evil organization of holding land, driving resources to uh, send out those social media urgings to help radicalize people. Uh, in part, though, you fight it domestically uh, by working uh, in this case with the Islamic community uh, so that they can work closely with law enforcement, identify when people are at risk of radicalization, often people at the fringes of society. Now here, this was not someone at the fringes of society. Right. This is someone who looked like they were enjoying the American dream. Uh, so even with the best of things, with the best intelligence, uh, putting military pressure on ISIS, uh, with a good cooperative relationship with the Islamic community, it still may not be enough in all cases. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other things that we can do, too, I think, frankly, to cut off the easy access of uh, assault weapons and high-capacity clips and, and whatnot. That will be important not only in these kind of domestic terror cases, right. but, you know, all kind of shooting cases, mass shooting cases in America. But we also, uh, to get to your point, uh, Bill, we need to fight the ideology. Right. Uh, How do we best do that? Well, Does I think, Intel I think, look at that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the reality is we're ill-positioned both as, an, as a government and as the American government right. uh, on the ideological battlefield because Muslims aren't going to listen to the U.S. government uh, uh, tell them what it means to be Muslim right. and what the Islamic faith has to say about killing innocent people. Right. Muslims have to tell other Muslims about that. Right. But we can play a role in empowering moderate voices uh, in the Islamic world, uh, leaders like King Abdullah and Jordan uh, and others right. who are, you know, broadcasting a message of tolerance and, and, and talking about this, how this is antithetical to Islam. So make no, no mistake about it. We're going to, we need a strong military force, using it smartly. We, we should, and I, I support the president who's been attempting one year to get us to authorize the use of military force. You're working on a bill. Uh, I'm, I like what I've heard so far. I would support that bill. I'd vote for it right now if, if I had that opportunity. You, you, you can do these things, and you can pass the, you know, the, the, the per people who are on the watch list don't allow them. That doesn't get to the heart of the issue. Look, I, I got enough problems with the NRA, but I'm not looking for more problems. 
I'm, I'm looking for an approach that I think you're capable of because I know where you stand and I know, I know how, you know, somewhat of how you think of going after this ideology. We can win that war. Why should we think that we're any less able to confront that ideology and we're more capable of confronting militarily the enemy? I, I don't know. This is our mentality. We thought we were going to do this in Iraq, and we thought we were going to do this in Afghanistan. We've, we, we, we had to abandon ship. You can't stay there forever, and yet there was a vacuum. When there's a vacuum, hateful people take advantage of it or try to take advantage of it. Well, and this, I think, points out, again, the central importance of trying to resolve the political problems because we can send our military in. I mean, we can send in the Marines and send in uh, large... Uh, uh, armed forces, uh, um, and we can we can defeat ISIS on the battlefield. We've done that before, right. but those battles don't stay won uh, unless you solve the political problem that the Sunnis have have been disenfranchised. There's nowhere for them to go, right. um, and that's what happened under Maliki when he took over. Uh, why we allowed Maliki? Why the United States supported him when he had no intention whatsoever of making Sunnis part of his government and having a a, dem a truly democratic government. Well, y you can't impose democracy. I mean, we can't do that. Uh, on the other hand, though, you can expose people to democracy. Well, and, and we can use our leverage uh, on the new government uh, in Iraq, not so new anymore, but uh, al uh to really uh, maximize the pressure to include the Sunnis, uh, to form National Guard units of Sunnis, uh, to make sure that the Sunnis are active participants in their right. own security. Uh, there's a lot the Iraqis want from us uh, militarily in terms of our support. There are things we need from them politically uh, to uh, encourage Sunnis to depart from ISIS. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of dimensions to this, but um, you know, just to underscore one of the challenges we talked about, kind of broadly getting the Muslim community to weigh in, as the president talked about the other day, uh, on this fight within Islam against this perversion of Islam. Right. Uh, but we also probably need a crowdsourcing effort uh, to attack the social media that ISIS is propagating. Like, like how? Well, because you know the government, the government is lousy at tweeting and Facebook right. posting, and uh, you know its messages are not very credible. We don't have the the manpower within the government to you know be responding to each and every post or tweet. Uh, but but uh, the vast majority of Muslims around the world don't agree with ISIS. Um, the vast majority of the civilized world doesn't agree with ISIS. We ought to be able to, to not only counter but drown out the social media campaign. Why, ha why has, and I don't want to mention any names because you can mention a lot of names, Donald Trump is not the problem. He's just a face of it. But, you know, we're, we're, we're accusing, we're bringing up things that happened 15 years ago that didn't happen was rumor of what happened. I come from Patterson, New Jersey, and Patterson has been accused, like uh, Jersey City was accused, of uh, Muslims marching in the street, celebrating in the street. That did not happen. In fact, I just talked with the police chief of my city, who was the police chief at that time, uh, Larry Spagnola, and he was on duty. He sent a force down there. We you know what to expect after the second building was hit. He said, the reason why we did it is they were informed by the FBI that there may be people on the way down there to cause problems, not Muslims, people like you and me yeah. who are non-Muslim. And this was a fact of life. And yet that story just got wheels, got legs, and walked out there. Something like that sows the seed and, you know, it feeds into, it feeds into Dash becoming even stronger. Well, it does, and you know we're in this crazy world now, Bill, where the facts just don't seem to matter. Yeah, why, uh, they why is that? They don't matter to a lot of the candidates. They don't matter to to a lot of the media. Right. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, this allegation of you know Muslims celebrating 9/11, um, when uh, when it's pointed out that there's no evidence of this, uh, those who want to believe it nonetheless say, well, of course, that's what the left-wing liberal conspiratorial media has to say you would expect that that's all the more proof that it really happened yeah how do you how do you overcome that kind of uh, conspiracy thinking i i am uh, looking at this situation very carefully and i would hope that our intel uh, has ears 
and has voices. I mean, we had Voice of America. What are we doing uh, in the communications field in, t in terms of conflicting with this ideology, which is very hateful, and, and, and the murderous ideas that come forth? What are we doing that you can talk about uh, of our, 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 besides dropping leaflets? Yeah. Well, we're not, we're not doing very much, and that which we are, we're not doing very well. Uh, we've had a lot of turnover, I think, in the State Department effort to combat uh, ISIS propaganda. Uh, I think our ideological pushback has been uh, very ineffectual. I we, agree. We're still kind of groping for what the response ought to be. Uh, and part of the I problem agree. is... Again, we know history, we don't know culture. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean by that? I do. I do know what you mean by that, and I think you're right. Um, which is, you know, part of the reason why I think we're uniquely ill-suited to be the messenger. Uh, but we need to help empower those that are credible voices within Islam that can talk about these yes. issues. Uh, that's these prob people died in our wars for crying out loud. Yeah. These folks, they're in the they're in the military service right now. How dare we segregate one? Really, we we did this in the Second World War. We had internment camps for the Japanese. And Italians, people forget that Italians were in some intern camps out on the West Coast. We, f we have short memories, or we don't know, maybe we don't know history as well as I thought we did. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that we're Americans, and we need to come together. How do we, how, in, in our final, final moment here, how do we stop San Ber Berardino yes. from happening again? even though they're looking for soft targets. There's no seamless system. We're all fallible human beings. Just a word about well, that. Well, you know, we are combing through all the facts of this investigation to figure out just when were these two radicalized? Who were they in contact with? Were there things that we should have seen? Uh, can this inform uh, us into how to improve our security in the future? Th that investigation is still very early but we're hoping that the results of it will improve our defenses here at home. Uh, ultimately though, you know, I think we have to recognize a couple things. And one is that it's dependent on a good relationship with the American Muslim community, a very right. key ally in this. Uh, and the second thing is that um, when people just talk among themselves and are radicalized in their basement, it's a very tough problem to deal with. I want to thank you, Adam, for coming on the show today. And uh, I hope you come back again. Because I'm sure a few months from now, things will be changing. A few moments from now, things will be changing. I want to thank you for watching this edition of To The Point. What an extremely important topic. I think you'd agree. You have heard our thoughts. I'd like to hear from you uh, about today's show. If you have any comments, if you have any concerns or questions, stay tuned. Our address, our phone number, our website uh, will appear in a moment. Thanks again for tuning in. It's a great country. Let's keep it great. I'll see you the next time on To The Point. Thanks. <laughs>